Thank you. I'm, um, I'm glad to uh, follow the uh, last presentation because I get to talk about people who give testimony. Okay. <laughs> I get to talk about people who give testimony to, uh, to some of the human rights um, issues that are the uh, subject of, of, of this whole uh, um, conference and particularly of the, of the last presentation. Um, African writers um, very largely feel an obligation to, uh, to, uh, to bring to public attention uh, the aspects of their societies that, uh, that should be critically um, uh, reviewed and, uh, uh, and changed where necessary for progress. And so both in their artistic creations as well as in autobiographical works, we find um, many forms, many discourses, many examples of testimony, uh, testimonies about human rights issues. And I'm going to, I'm going to start with some autobiographical works, uh, uh, but giving some uh, sort of formal structure to this, this whole topic, I will say that the human rights focus of these intellectuals uh, comes generally in one of four topics that I have identified, or four aspects. One is the independent struggle from, uh, from colonial days. Not that they have not identified some, uh, uh, some human rights issues in, uh, well, in, in colonial times too, but, uh, but the, most, uh, the most conscious articulation or identification of human rights issues uh, begins, in my reading, uh, with the uh, with the narratives about independence struggles, and I'm going to give a few authors and, and titles. Um, and within even the independence struggles, we have internal uh, uh, struggles, uh, uh, the side of those who seem to be collaborating with the, uh, with the colonizer versus those who are more radical and so forth. So we have internal strife, uh, internal um, Lee um, um, instigated human rights uh, uh, issues as well as those that are external. We have also um, human rights issues that come up in the neo-colonial uh, situation. Um, and those are sometimes uh, um, in tandem with or juxtaposed against some traditional uh, uh, um, uh, human rights issues, such as we saw in the film yesterday. And I will make some reference to the film uh, to show how that traditional issue uh, is presented in a context of a colonial influence uh, and neo-colonial influence as well. Um, and then we have civil wars also. So after independence struggle uh, uh, and at the same time as uh, neo-colonial um, uh, uh, states are, are in existence, we have civil wars, uh, particularly, uh, well, the one uh, that, uh, that I'm going to refer to is the Nigerian Civil War, but it is by no means limited to that one. So we have, uh, we have issues of human rights uh, in which the, the violators of human rights are, uh, are the uh, colonizers, the former colonizers. We have issues of human rights in which the violators of human rights uh, uh, are, are uh, compatriots um, 
in a more modern state and we have all along issues of human rights in which the violators of human rights are traditional practices and the, uh, the practitioners of those practices, as the film from last night uh, indicates. As I said, I want to start with, uh, with, um, with autobiographical texts um, with a quote from a writer uh, from Malawi um, who, who has edited a book of, of um, autobiographical texts from African writers. And he says, this is Jack Mapanje from Malawi, um, in his introduction to an anthology of African prison writing titled Gathering Seaweed, Jack Mapanje inquires, what does the existence of such a body of work suggest? And goes on to comment trenchantly that since, in, since independence, and here's Mapanji's quote, African leaders seem to have copied only the brutality, corrupt practices, and selfish individualism from their colonial masters. The implication is that African leaders are becoming progressively intolerant of constructive criticism from their own people. So the autobiographical works that I am going to uh, um, uh, speak about briefly are prison journals from some of Africa's most respected writers, uh, starting not least with Wale Shoyenka, the Nigerian Nobel laureate. The Man Died is specifically a prison journal, although Shoyenka, who has written three autobiographical installments, uh, the first of his childhood, um, uh, the second one is autobiographical, but it focuses on his father, and the third one, uh, uh, which is, uh, which is a, a more recent um, account of his own political uh, struggles, because Shoyenka is, as a as 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 a writer, a uh, a militant and outspoken um, uh, uh, critic of of um, of human rights violations and, in general, of the uh, of the um, difficulties that African states are putting their th people through as a result of corrupt uh, uh, governments for the most part. But the, the autobiography, uh, the um, prison journal, uh, The Man Died, um, uh, is less an account of his year or so in solitary confinement than a reflection on what happens to the, uh, the thinking of a person in that situation. And I have to say, uh, he was imprisoned during the Nigerian Civil War in the late 1960s, um, essentially for having, uh, uh, for having attempted to negotiate a peaceful uh, uh, settlement of the differences before war broke out, but because but he was accused of treason, and so uh, uh, because he was speaking to the leadership of the then breaking away uh, um, Eastern Nigerian uh, Biafran uh, 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 section of the country, and because the federal government was opposing that secession, the fact that Shoyenka. Uh, crossed the lines and tried to speak with uh, with a leader of that um, that 
rebel group, then he was uh, considered, uh, he was arrested and imprisoned for treason, for treason and was in solitary confinement for most of the year that he was there. So he says, this is his, uh, this is his, uh, uh, this is the, the, uh, the impetus to the publication. It's a letter to compatriots prompted by two items on my table at this moment. One is the latest copy of the journal Transition, of which he was one of the founding editors, which has recently been erected and so forth. The message on the latter, uh, excuse me, the other is a cablegram from home, because he was in exile at this time. The message on the latter is a simple one. The man died. It is the former, however, a letter from a victim of the current Greek fascism which has created uh, the intrusive shock. And we'll see that Shoyenka, like the other writers, uh, sees the difficulties of his own uh, country in a wider world context. He knows that, that, uh, uh, that Nigeria is not the only uh, repressive government, certainly at the time that he was in prison. And so he, he's able to see this in a larger world context. Um, it is always a shock to encounter duplicated experiences in another being, especially such experiences as reproduced near identical sensations, thoughts, reactions, and even expressions in the other man. For, for intimately felt experiences, it is even a little frightening. One knows, of course. Indeed, it is the certitude of an indestructible continuum of ordeal survival affirmation, constantly reinforced by the knowledge of predecessors in this cycle, which sustains a prisoner in his darkest moments, and which his liberty regained urges on him a pledge and a duty to all victims of power sadism in and outside of his own country. The author of this letter is a professor in Greece, George um, Managakis, at present a captive of fascist dictators. This is written in the early 1970s. The book was published in 1972. I quote some passages from his letter to reinforce certain very simple truths of a prisoner's precarious existence in isolation. It seems to me that testimonies such as this should become a kind of chain letter hung permanently on the leaden conscience of the world. To defeat, to uproot in entirety any concepts of and pretensions to a mitigating base for inflicting atrocities on the human mind, it is essential that the extent of this unnatural strain be fully grasped. After that, there can be no pleas, no arguments. Each individual will make only a simple act of choice. Do I say yes to this or no? The Greek prisoner writes, among so many other things, the anguish of being in prison is also a deep need to communicate with one's fellow human beings. It is a need that suffocates one at times. Self-defense. That is why I write. That is how I manage to keep my mind under control. If I let it loose, unsupported by the frame of written thought, it goes wild. It takes strange, sinister byways and ends up by begetting monsters. We need somebody else's mind in order to keep on working terms with our own. We also need moments devoid of thought. That's Shoyenka quoting the Greek uh, professor. Back to Shoyenka, and I'm almost finished this uh, citation. I testify to the strange, sinister byways of the mind in solitary confinement, to the strange monsters it begets. It is certain that all captors and jailers know it, that they create such conditions, specially for those whose minds they fear. Then, confidently, they await the rupture. It is necessary to keep in mind always that we know only of those 
who have survived the inhuman passage. Okay, so Shoyenka's, uh, the man died, um, uh, is a, is a, um, a, a, a tract on the violation of a person's uh, uh, mental humanity uh, during, uh, during imprisonment. Um, another prison journal is by Ngugi Wathiongo, a Kenyan. And Gugi, as I said, born in Kenya, grew up during the time of Mau Mau's struggle. Mau Mau was the freedom fighter. Uh, uh, group that's not how it's described in the in the British historiography, uh, but it was the freedom fighter group in Kenya, and so uh, Ngugi grew up during that time, uh, in the 1940s, uh, 30s and 40s, and um, um, attended university, became a professor, and um, began writing uh, plays short stories, novels, which became more and more critical of the, uh, of the independent government, that is the, the government of, by this time, uh, Daniel Arap Moy, which replaced um, Jomo Kenyatta. Uh, and so he was eventually um, jailed because his writings were considered subversive and um, uh, he writes in his prison diary, his is an accounting of, of his ordeal during, he also was in, uh, was in prison for about a year. I don't think all of it was solitary confinement. Um, um, interesting, and, and he was eventually um, uh, freed from prison and lived in exile in the UK and in the US for a number of years, he still lives in, in the US. Uh, but after um, the Moy government, uh, um, he eventually, with his wife, Kenyan wife, returned um, home to Kenya for a visit in the early 2000s. Uh, by the way, his, the books that he continued to write continued to be critical of the government. And uh, there's one interesting account where uh, uh, a novel that he wrote um, uh, appeared to be a story about an actual person. And, uh, and the government uh, tried to pursue uh, Ngugi to, to find that person, only to learn that the uh, that, that it was entirely fictitious. It did not even closely represent any one individual. And so, according to this one account, the government arrested the novel, um, uh, which means, of course, they removed it from all places, warehouses, book, bookshelves, and, and so forth, bookstores, and, uh, and, and the novel was banned. In any case, uh, but he's writing those things now from, from the UK or from, from the US. Uh, when he went home, uh, when he and his wife went home in the early 2000s, um, he was uh, pursued and uh, and and um, uh, brutally, well, he burglarized, but 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 brutally assaulted uh, uh, in the apartment where they were uh, uh, staying for the time that he was there. Um, they raped his wife in his presence. They 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 bound him and raped his wife in his presence, and so. Um, the, since this is by this time a new government, questions arose, 
who is this who is still uh, uh, pursuing him? Uh, was this a personal, uh, a personal pursuit, or was this still the Kenyan uh, government beh uh, behind it? And it was um, doubted that it was the government, but nevertheless, there are forces in the population in Kenya that that uh, apparently still resent the uh, the very um, uh, uh, stark criticism usually allegorical, uh, so you have to, uh, it takes a bit of, of intellectual um, uh, gymnastics to recognize it, but nevertheless, um, this is a man who is still persecuted. Uh, and then uh, um, one more of, of two uh, remaining prison diaries. This one is uh, Ken Sarawiwa. Ken Sar Sarawiwa was Nigerian also, not involved in the Civil War, but uh, involved in, uh, in opposition to the government because of the government's involvement with the destruction of, uh, uh, well, the government's involvement with, uh, with the oil business of, of Nigeria. Um, most of the oil in Nigeria comes from the eastern region, uh, which is the region that Ken Sarawiwa uh, came from, and the destruction of the land uh, uh, with virtually no attention to, uh, to compensation or to, uh, to infrastructure uh, uh, generated a political movement from that section of the country of which Ken Sarawiwa was an outspoken activist. And he, uh, he um, uh, carried out his activism in as publicly and internationally a forum as possible, um, protecting himself with that international uh, uh, visibility. And in fact, uh, um, however, the end of that is that anyhow, he was executed by the Nigerian government. And I want to read uh, Jack Mapanji's statement to that. Um, Right. Between the recognitions Shoyenka arrives at while under detention in the late 1960s and Sarawiwa's recorded in the mid-1990s, there is clear common ground, but that period of a quarter century marked also a decline in the sensitivities of Nigeria's ruling elite. Shoyenka notes how, from the early days of his arrest under Gowan's military regime, the fact that his case was being reported in the international press was a matter of concern to his captors. But by the time of Sarawiwa's first address, uh, first arrest in the 1990s under Babangida, who is running for president again uh, in the next election, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that certain concern was less vital. And by the time of Sarawiwa's second arrest and execution under Abacha, it had evaporated entirely. Um, so the international attention uh, receded in its importance to the Nigerian government. The, the, the volume of the attention did not recede at all. In fact, uh, Sarawiwa was executed in the middle of the uh, the um, uh, the um, the Commonwealth the annual Commonwealth meeting of of foreign ministers or or heads of state um, uh, uh, and 
and cables were sent to the government at the time to, uh, you know, not to uh, to execute this person and so forth. And there was a, a trial that lasted about three and a half seconds, and and he and some fellow activists were executed. So, the the international visibility was no longer a protective shield for uh, for dissident writers. And then finally, um, one other. Um, Oh, and it was because the for for Sarawiwa, the oil business. I don't have to tell you. Certainly, is uh, um, is is not something that the government will tolerate any any um, any criticism of. And so uh, so Sarawiwa was critical not not as much about the corruption in that oil business as about the destruction of that, uh, uh, that oil uh, business to, uh, to the land and to, to the future of the people in his country. So, uh, so he, was, he was unrelenting, and uh, so the only way to stop him, the government felt, was to stop him entirely. And then finally, um, Also, a Nigerian, uh, a journalist, however, not a creative writer, as, as all the others I've mentioned are. Uh, she, wa she uh, and is still alive, uh, a, a journalist uh, under the same, uh, at the same uh, time that uh, Sarawiwa was, was executed under the Abacha regime. And so she also has written a, a, a prison diary. So, even before we look at the um, at the literary works of these writers, uh, I feel that it is most important to to um, acknowledge their voices as uh, um, as dissidents in every way that they can uh, be activists against repression that they uh, perceive from their governments, uh, which involved, of course, human rights violations at every turn. Um, OK, now to go to the literary works. Um, um, the topics that I gave, or, or yeah, the different themes that I enumerated in the beginning, um, uh, neo-colonial uh, or independent struggles, civil wars, uh, um, internecine strife, um, uh, traditions, and so forth, uh, we find definitely in the literary works and, and the films. Uh, the same writers whom I have named for their uh, autobiographical works or their, their prison diaries uh, certainly um, give major attention to uh, uh, to these issues in their in their literary works. Um, um, I'm going to mention uh, mostly Ngugi and then some other ones. Ngugi Wathiongo, um, one of his earliest novels is on um, uh, female genital mutilation. His second novel uh, um, is on that topic. And like Semben in the film yesterday, uh, that we saw yesterday, he looks very sympathetically at the, at the traditional thinking that, that uh, uh, protects this, uh, this um, uh, custom. Uh, but he more, uh, but he connects the uh, uh, the, the critique with uh, um, uh, with a colonial um, uh, uh, with with colonial um, uh, cultural um, intervention as well, because he pits two sisters uh, against each other both of whom are of good family, 
uh, uh, and who certainly look forward to marriage and family. Uh, but the father is a Christian missionary. Uh, one of the daughters is pulled to the uh, is pulled to the the uh, uh, to the understanding of a proper woman uh, in the tradition. Also, the young man she wants to marry, who is from the other side of the river, uh, um, his family certainly expects that, and she runs away to uh, have herself circumcised, runs away because her father forbids it, uh, as, uh, as a Christian missionary, he forbids it uh, uh, of both of his daughters. And uh, so, so we see uh, uh, we see within one family, and obviously that is symbolic for, uh, for the, 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 the family of, of the Kikuyu people anyway, if not larger uh, uh, in greater extent for Kenyans and Africans more broadly, how this, this issue uh, uh, with, its religious, um, uh, with its religious support how the, uh, the, 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 the cultures in contact um, affect this uh, tradition as well. What happens in that novel is, um, is that the girl who is circumcised uh, dies. Uh, Ngugi wants to leave no, I mean, he may be sympathetic in presenting the issue, but he is not sympathetic at all in, uh, uh, in, in the view that he, that he holds. Uh, although he certainly has his criticism of the of the Christian father's uh, um, uh, authoritarian uh, way of, of handling the issue. The fact that the daughter ran off and got circumcised was of a greater offense to this father because she disobeyed him than was his, um, his uh, disagree disagreement, uh, for, uh, disagreement of, uh, with her choice to be circumcised. Uh, I'm gonna, where's the? I was told there's something I could wipe the board with. I think in the previous discussion there was an issue of oh um, uh, what kinds of documents are available for people to inform themselves about that human rights issues. Well, literary documents abound, um, uh, and so this is is just one of those. Um, uh, Ngugi also writes. In his, no in his novel, Petals of Blood, uh, this is his castigation of the, of the corruption of, of neo-colonial um, uh, Kenya. And the, uh, he is very much uh, a, a, um, a champion of the common people. And uh, so this novel uh, gives a lot of evidence of the, of the uh, exploitation by the leadership uh, uh, of the common people. Um, uh, for Ngugi, the leaders in the early independent African nations were simply the same people who had been the colonial masters in black skin. Uh, because in, in a number of cases, the where independence was, was uh, was gained without struggle. Um, in, in many cases around the continent of Africa, the leaders who emerged uh, were leaders that were fairly handpicked by the colonials. So in other words, and, and that's why uh, the colonial masters uh, um, can in some, like to say sometimes that they granted independence. Um, uh, and in many cases, that is what it was. Those who did not struggle, um, um, uh, it was granted, but under, uh, on the grounds in many cases that the leaders who emerged were in many cases puppets of the, 
of the colonial masters. Uh, and so this is uh, one of the things that we see in, in Ngugi's uh, Petals of Blood, how the leadership, uh, not only the political leadership, but those who emerge as business people and those who get the, the uh, aid money and so forth, exploit the, uh, uh, the, uh, the common people who have, uh, uh, who have um, uh, no other recourse and who are after independence moving in droves into the big cities because the uh, uh, because there there is no work for them in the uh, in the rural area they have little education and so forth and so in so many of the of the novels uh, issues like prostitution uh, are very common because uh, for young women uh, the uh, the situation of becoming exploited because they have no other uh, way of making a, a living is, uh, is a topic that we see very, uh, very frequently. I want to go through these fairly um, uh, quickly. Um, another writer who um, uh, I've, I've mentioned one who, uh, Ngugi's work on the, on the, tra on the traditional um, uh, practice of, of um, female uh, genital mutilation. Um, Bessie Head's novel, um, when, Rain, when Rain Clouds Gather, uh, depicts other traditional practices which are uh, violations of, of human rights issues and particularly the corruption in the chieftaincy system. Uh, we see um, uh, a situation in which uh, a chief who has um, uh, very overriding, almost dictatorial powers over the people in the village, um, uh, does what is necessary to, to um, uh, defraud the people, does what is necessary to, uh, to deprive them of, of, um, of, of, of um, gifts that have been donated from outside, does what is necessary to ensure that his own sons uh, will, will stay in the chieftaincy and so forth. But we have with Bessie Head, uh, definitely, uh, we also see the collusion of the chief with the colonial masters. And this is, a, this is an issue that a number of, of writers, uh, Chinwa Achebe in some of his novels, uh, also depict the collusion of the chief. In, in fact, Again, and before independence, the uh, during colonialism, the um, uh, the naming of a chief was often the uh, prerogative taken by the colonial masters, uh, um, during which the chiefs, uh, whether benign to or unbeknownst to the uh, uh, to the colonial masters took that advantage of, of um, their position to exploit the population uh, in whatever way um, would maintain their advantage. Um, uh, and in terms of um, other uh, traditional, uh, uh, traditional practices um, uh, that that, uh, that authors uh, portray, um, many of them have to do with, with gender in, in other ways. Uh, in Bessie Head's novel, there is um, a scene in which a young man from outside comes, to, comes into a town and uh, he is seen as a respectable visitor and so the way that hospitality is shown to him is by 
offering to him uh, a young girl for the night. I mean, he's offered a, a place to sleep and a young girl to sleep with. And uh, he refuses that because he says, this could be my sister. And the people, even the girl's mother, doesn't understand uh, uh, why, uh, why he is rejecting, because this is hospitality uh, uh, for him. The girl herself doesn't understand, and she fears that she somehow displeases him. So, um, uh, so uh, these traditional practices are, are, um, uh, uh, are so deeply ingrained that, uh, that they have their own justification and so forth, and, and our novelists, our African novelists, do portray those. Uh, I want to uh, just call, uh, uh, just um, give two more examples of novels, fairly, quite recent novels, in fact, um, one by a Zimbabwean and one by a, uh, by a Nigerian. The Zimbabwe independence struggle of the 1980s, set 1970s and 80s, uh, <clears throat> subsequently produced uh, some revolutionary changes within black Zimbabwean society. And as a result, and subsequent to that, writers uh, are examining the uh, uh, are looking back at the at the independence struggle uh, um, with a literary critical eye. Tsitsi Dangaremga, who uh, is also a filmmaker, and I'm going to mention uh, one or two of her films just quickly, uh, and who studied film here in Berlin, um, and is married to a, a German uh, um, a director or um, camera uh, um, person. Um, what do you call that? Uh, anyway, um, has written a, a novel which is published only a couple of years ago in which um, the, the um, radical measures taken by the freedom fighters uh, in, um, in recruiting people in their struggle uh, and in uh, persecuting many who, ref who did not want to go into, uh, uh, you know, to, to enter the military struggle uh, or the guerrilla struggle. Um, the freedom fighters who, uh, uh, who were very, um, uh, who, uh, when they found families who, well, the storyteller, the narrator in this novel is a teenage girl whose family is middle class, a middle class black family, and the girl is uh, a student at the finest school for black girls in, in Zimbabwe. And that school goes on during the Civil War uh, and in this girl's experience, um, her family is ultimately um, uh, persecuted for sending, uh, uh, for colluding with the, with the colonial masters. And the father is tortured. The family must come and watch his torture because this is what happens to, uh, to brothers who are not uh, uh, um, supporters of the, uh, of the, not only are they not supporters of the revolution, but they, uh, they, um, uh, they uh, are behaving counter to the revolution by sending their children to the school. So, uh, uh, so the, uh, we see from the daughter's perspective, um, her mother's 
um, experience in watching her husband being tortured. Being tortured, uh, we see her siblings, and we see her not wanting to look. So, so Dangaremga does it very, very interestingly. This girl never wants to look, but she's looking at her mother, and so she's telling what is happening to her father by uh, uh, describing her mother's reaction to what is happening. And then a, a sibling, uh, uh, she does, who comes in sort of. Uh, uh, in the middle of it, and so, so she describes the sibling's uh, shocked reaction also, but the girl herself refusing to turn and look at it. So, um, uh, and this is a topic that has not yet come out in in Zimbabwean literature about the revolution, about the um, the independence struggle. Earlier, there were uh, um, uh, certainly in the uh, on the level of short stories, there were. Uh, there were narratives about the uh, uh, gender uh, oppression in the revolutionary struggle. Um, um, uh, women comrades in arms who would be raped by their comrades in arms, or if not that, um, uh, after the war, a woman comrade uh, who had served valiantly would not be elected as a member of the town council uh, um, uh, um, uh, because it was time for her to go back to the kitchen. So the, such uh, uh, tales as those came uh, as early as the 1990s soon, or 1980s even soon after the Zimbabwe um, uh, independence was was achieved. But, but this um, uh, more uh, uh, deeply, um, uh, uh, deeply delving into some of the uh, the um, internal political uh, um, 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 differences within the uh, within the struggle. Uh, this is new within Tsitsi's work. It's a very gripping and I can't say all-encompassing um, narrative of definitely from the side of the um, Eastern Nigerians, the Igbos, the Biafrans, uh, about the Nigerian Civil War, which is called the Biafran War by, uh, by Igbos. Um, but we see we, we see um, uh, comrades who take different sides. We see, we see how the poorly trained and poorly paid soldiers on the other side of the war um, exploited uh, uh, any uh, one they could take as prisoners simply because they, they were hungry. Uh, and we could see in many cases that the, that the uneducated, uh, unfed, unpaid soldier didn't really have anything against these people, but because, and many of them were drafted, uh, but because of that situation, it, it produced a bestiality that, uh, uh, that uh, one believes does not happen in, in, in peace times. Uh, uh, we, see, um, uh, uh, we see families having to see family members uh, brutalized and mutilated, um, uh, uh, and so, um, uh, the Civil War, uh, we, we get an adequate picture of the politics of it, but the, but the story is told from within a family, uh, essentially two sisters, um, one who is married to a, uh, a British uh, a man who has lived in Nigeria uh, for a long time, is sympathetic. With the uh, with the cause speaks uh, very good Ebo to everyone's surprise, and uh, and the other uh, married to a a um, uh, a radical uh, professor, and uh, but the two sisters are equal participants in the drama. So it's not just the 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 men. The the story is told by one sister, but we see her own activism. We see her sisters more, uh, it's, a, it's a middle class family and the sister is less inclined to, uh, to, uh, to express political viewpoints or to be involved in it and in the end uh, she becomes radicalized and um, because you get the feeling that if you are Igbo, 
then you cannot not be involved. Uh, the way that, that this novel is presented, you cannot not be involved if you are Igbo. I mean, it is your, your, your people that are, um, uh, that are uh, in danger. It is your, your, your nation because they see the, uh, the, the Biafran uh, enclave as uh, the secessionist enclave as their nation, and uh, so it's it's uh, it's patriotism, but uh, um, uh, but with um, uh, with um, she plays down ethnic loyalty uh, um, more than patriotism, and this is our land, this is our home, and uh, our way of life, which is uh, which is being brutalized and and accosted. Now, a film or two. Um, we, uh, Semben has more of those, and I just want to talk about uh, Come to Tiawa. Um, Last night, the question was asked whether the film uh, Mulade uh, was based on any true story, and it is not. But this one is, Come to Chihuahua, is about um, uh, Senegalese or African soldiers in the French army uh, at the end of the Second World War. Um, these soldiers, for a while, uh, had, along with their French um, uh, their French fellow soldiers been captured uh, by, by Nazis uh, but were liberated together and the French soldiers uh, received their pay and were discharged. But the African soldiers were told, well, we are going to um, first uh, um, um, uh, transfer you back to to Africa, and then we will give you your pay. In other words, we're not going to discharge you here in in Europe. We are going to discharge you in uh, at home in Africa, and 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 then you will be dispersed to your various homes. Um, and what we see is a a gradual uh, a gradual lowering of these. Uh, um, veterans' status to what looked very much like uh, uh, colonial uh, peons because they not only did not get their pay, uh, and they were all the, the, the French um, uh, government, and this is a real uh, situation, a real story. They not only did not get their pay, they were told, uh, well, you know, there's some problems uh, in the treasury, but it will come, it will come. And then when the pay did come, they gave it to them in local currency uh, at the, at the uh, devalued rate that the local currency um, uh, was counted in in Africa. And so it, it amounted to ha about half of the pay to which they were entitled. Um, the, the soldiers protested, of course, and they continued uh, their protest for proper treatment. Once they got transferred uh, to a camp in Africa, their military uniforms were, were exchanged for something that looked like houseboys or, or laborers' uniforms. And so we see a gradual demotion, demoting of these people from from military heroes who had fought alongside with their French uh, uh, counterparts uh, in behalf of France. And as Semben reminds us, they were fighting somebody else's war. Uh, uh, and they are gradually demoted to what uh, uh, had been their colonial status. And eventually, because their protests and their insistence on, on being given what they were entitled to, um, uh, uh, persisted, the French burned the camp. Um, a few survived, so we get to see them burying their dead uh, comrades. Uh, but this is a chapter in, in French military history which, um, which has 
not been uh, resolved to any greater uh, satisfaction uh, than that. And so Semben in this film, uh, um, the, the wonderful thing about, about film and particularly the way Semben handles it is of course he allows us to, to focus on particular aspects that he is, uh, that he is interested in, uh, but still the basic story of these, uh, these soldiers, um, of the mistreatment by, uh, that was given to these soldiers is, is the bottom line. And um, quickly, two films by Dangaremga, by this um, um, film. She's a writer, but also a filmmaker. Um, one of them, uh, everybody's child, everyone's child, is about AIDS orphans, um, and we see the gendered fates of orphans. Uh, we we have a family uh, in which mother first and then father uh, dies die of uh, AIDS, and. Uh, three children in the family ranging in age from a, a boy about 14, a girl about 12, and then a small one. <coughs> um, the boy is able to go off to the city and and through legal and illegal means uh, manages to earn enough money to keep body and soul together. The girl who takes the responsibility for the younger child uh, stays at home and is exploited by the, uh, by the local uh, merchant uh, to whom she has to go and to whom she has to ask for credit for, uh, for meal or, or, or for what they need in the house. And so she, he is a, she is ex sexually exploited by, by um, uh, by this man, and then all of the children are exploited by their uncle. Here again, the family tradition comes in and exacerbates the situation. The uncle, uh, um, who feels an obligation to, uh, to provide something, or who knows it's his obligation to provide something for the children but doesn't want to, uh, sells the one piece of farm equipment that the children could have used to, to scratch uh, their, their crop together, so the, the, the uncle sells that. Um, Dangaremga's uh, other film called um, uh, Neria is, uh, is about a woman, a young widow, who with her husband had with their own hands, built their nice, uh, cozy home for themselves and their two children. The husband dies in a bicycle accident, and um, the rest of the film is about her struggle to keep the house that she physically helped build, not only uh, um, uh, financially um, uh, um, uh, contributed to also. His brother, the late husband's brother, her brother-in-law, claims the right to the house uh, because technically he is responsible for, uh, for providing for his brother's children. And so he claims the rights to the house, has the locks changed so that the, the wife cannot get into it. Uh, and, uh, uh, and family tradition is behind him uh, in, uh, uh, in his claim to the rights of the house. Uh, she is advised, however, to see a, is, is referred to a lawyer who does um, uh, uh, human rights um, uh, um, counseling and is, um, is told that, that the country is in the process of, of making a law that will protect the rights of widows. And so it has a happy ending, has a happy ending in that regard. But just like the film last night, the happy ending for the protagonist um, uh, brings, a, brings conflict in the community anyway, because the happy ending for the protagonist is in itself a disruption of, of, um, of tradition. And so, so one has to uh, think about 
how the family is going to, you know, what the relationships are between the, the, the children and their uncle and, and so forth. But in any case, this, uh, uh, this um, juxtaposition of, of traditional practices uh, with, um, with more contemporary or more modern um, uh, um, um, solutions to, uh, or, or more modern um, um, strategies for handling issues is, is uh, something that we've seen in, in Sam Ben's film last, film last night, as well as these two. I will stop here, and if there's time for questions um, or comments, I will can entertain those. But I recommend any of the, the uh, literary works uh, and the films as a form of documentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Adams. Um, would anyone like to ask a question to, uh, to Dr. Adams? Thank you very much. I don't know how much Europeans or the world knows about African traditions. My question is very simple. And uh, do you know some of African traditions that is accepted by the, the world or, let's say, the Western word. You mean, is there any good news? Is that what you're <laughs> asking? Uh, that's what Wangari Matha. Of course. I mean, uh, of course. And uh, the, hospi if, if the hospitality, if, the hospitality, the the generosity, the, um, uh, the, the, the I mean, the, the, the family obligation uh, tradition has many positive aspects as well as its negative aspects. Because we're talking about human rights violations here uh, uh, is why I focused on, on those. But, uh, um, but of course, I mean, I, this, this family obligation uh, practice is the reason that many junior sisters and brothers get educated. Uh, uh, it is the source of, uh, I mean, in, we know that in, that in the tradition out of which that Zimbabwe uh, widows, um, uh, widows um, uh, rights issue came, that the responsibility of caring for the, the widow and her children is, is a part of the tradition that has very positive uh, um, outcomes and, uh, and people from outside Africa who are familiar with those, uh, with those traditions, I'm sure acknowledge that. Um, so yeah, any of those, yeah, that one I would say has as much, has, is for positive, uh, you know, it, uh, exists for positive reasons to make sure that the widow and the children are cared for. It is just that when, is, when it is exploited, I mean, when you see this wife working with her hands to help build this, this, this house, and you see that she is a professional woman and her money has gone into the house too, and you see this brother come and change the locks, you know, uh, 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 you see the tradition uh, um, in conflict with, uh, uh, with some, some individual uh, uh, issues uh, with it, and so that's, um, uh, uh, that's what you have, but of course there are positive traditions that are recognized by the outside world, sure. Thank you. Um, my name is Ronan, I come from Venezuela, and I just want to say, this is not a question, this is just a, a remark. I think it's very, very good what you say is an uncomfortable, it's not comfortable, the truth, to hear, because it's something really graphic in a good way. Yeah. Make you aware that we're talking about human rights. But uh, more important even is that we have to remember or keep in consideration that one law cannot fit all the situation. And we have to take in consideration the backgrounds, the traditions, and the beliefs of the people when we try to work with human rights or do something to make it better. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. That's it. Thank you <laughs> for the comment, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Eddie Adams. I wish to thank you for giving such a perfect lecture. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, 
I remember reading uh, Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart mm -hmm. many, many years ago. Exactly, yeah. And that story still remains with me on how the last words of Akonko, mm -hmm. how things, uh, the tradition which he tried to hold on. Yes. And it becomes uh, uh, broken. Unraveled, yes. Yeah. Yes. And yes. yesterday's movie gave me a, a, a thought on that piece. Mm -hmm. Could I ask your comments that in Africa, that uh, the customs or traditions are jealously guarded by each community? Is this uh, an obstacle to uh, a unity? in the form of uh, uh, development of the, of the nation states. Thank you. Um, whether you're asking whether traditions of a particular ethnic group, whether the fact that there are many uh, different traditions and the, the desire to hold on to those traditions uh, is an obstacle to unity in the state. Um, uh, it certainly presents a challenge, and um, I, though, would not say that that it is the desire to hold on to, and we're thinking about some practices, uh, uh, at least in, in this uh, context. I don't think that it is the desire to hold on to some practices by this group or that group that is the biggest barrier to, uh, uh, to unity. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned uh, uh, Achebe because in that work, which is considered you know, the classic work, at least considered by the West, the, the classic work of African literature, it is the work which introduced African literature to the rest of the, uh, to the uh, rest of the world, reading world. Um, he has a wonderful example of, of a human rights uh, violation there by tradition. Um, Okonkwo um, uh, is, a, is a community pillar, and he has, he has um, uh, committed an offense uh, for which his, uh, his um, punishment, I think that's how it comes. Anyway, there is a, he is obliged to sacrifice a young boy. And he, ha this young boy has lived with him for a number of years, uh, uh, and he is obliged to... Are we sure? Okay, okay, thank you, thank you, it shows you. Right, okay, right, he's not, he's not his biological son, thank you, I, I knew that I had it better than that. But he has, this boy has been with him for a long time, right, and he is obliged to sacrifice him, and he, uh, um, uh, it causes him uh, great uh, uh, um, um, distress, uh, anguish, uh, but he does it. He does it anyway, and then of course he is, uh, he is disciplined uh, for that, but um, um, but Achebe is, is, is allowing us to look at that custom. Uh, similarly, Wale Shoyenka, the Nobel laureate, uh, uh, who is best known for his drama, uh, one of his best known dramas is Death and the King's Horseman. This is very simply, or simplistically uh, put, about a, uh, a, um, a a respected and, and uh, a highly placed assistant to the king who, at the time of the king's death, is expected to be killed also. He must, he's the king's horseman. He must accompany the king into the next world. And so Shoyenka has us examine this tradition. Uh, um, he lets he reminds us that this is a living human being whose life is going to be sacrificed for the guy who's already dead, and so. Uh, but I don't think it's traditions like those which are keeping which are the main obstacle to uh, uh, to um, uh, to unity. But these traditions, 
uh, far less now, but nevertheless, Shoyenka uses that very um, strong example, uh, a striking example of a tradition to remind uh, 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 fellow Nigerians or Yoruba or, or remind the world that we must always interrogate uh, traditions uh, um, in every generation, in every era, to, uh, to remind ourselves of their, their um, uh, relevancy, their applicability. And if, if it's not any longer relevant, then we should do something else uh, about it. So, so he's used that very striking tradition to, uh, to, to, to raise that issue. Yeah. Yes? Uh, can I read off my uh, of course, when uh, the tribes are mentioned, the, the tribes are divided by the colonial rule as well. And uh, if we take the example of uh, Nigeria again, the Yoruba tribe, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a very important part of it lives in Dahomey, uh, yes. present Benin. Benin, yes. And uh, another uh, big important part uh, in Nigeria. Uh, in your, how do you observe the evolution of this nationhood? Do the Yoruba living in in the present Benin, former uh, Dahomey? Yeah, uh, consider themselves as different from, did they start to feel different as from Nigerian, uh, Yoruba, or the way, uh, do they, uh, is it valid to, do they, uh, the way around, that's to say, the Nigerian Yoruba, uh, do they feel that they are different from uh, Benin Yoruba? This, this uh, artificial division mm -hmm. of the <coughs> tribe uh, lead to a differentiation in their culture, in their habits, and that type of things, in your opinion? In my opinion, the market woman who crosses the border to buy goods to sell at home. And to pay tribute to go to the chief if you don't wear the tribe. Uh, I'm thinking of a market woman who is not paying gold. Not Let me answer the question the way I, I see it. I'm thinking of a market woman who sells cloth and who buys some of her cloth from other Yorubas or, or, or people in the next town, which happens to be across a political border which doesn't matter to her. Uh, because she, because the language that she speaks, I mean, sometimes it's the commercial language, sometimes it's Hausa anyway. Um, uh, but in my opinion, the everyday life of so many uh, hardworking people who have to scratch their lives together is not about anything that is determined in the capital city. Um, uh, and so, I mean, yes, intellectuals deal with it and politicians do too, but in my experience, the traffic um, uh, across borders by simple traders, the traffic across borders by, um, uh, you know, from airport to airport. Um, uh, I mean, there are students at the University of Ghana who, who come from uh, Nigeria and from Cameroon and so forth. Um, it's my impression that nationality does not play a big role in the everyday lives of people. Where is the best university in West Africa right now that I want to send my child to? Um, or the one that stays open year round, it's Legon, it's in, the, it's in Ghana. Or where, where can I open another branch of the um, of the uh, uh, business I have in uh, selling automobile parts, it's across the border. So that's how I, I don't see nationality uh, as being a major issue 
uh, in the everyday lives of, of, of people. In fact, I, I, I'm, I'm from the U.S., and so I, I see people in West Africa, anyway, moving and interacting in ways that people in different states in the United States do, or in different states in Linda in, in Germany do too. Yes, my parents come from Baden-Württemberg, but, uh, uh, but uh, I'm studying in uh, uh, Bayern or something like that. So uh, when it is necessary, then nationality might come in, but I don't see it as a, as a, um, uh, um, um, as a, Yes, right. Mm. Yes. With, I'm afraid, actually, we're going to have to, oh. to, to put an end okay. to the discussion. But uh, I'd like to ask everyone to join me in a very, very warm round of applause for Dr. Thank you.